Hi. Hey everyone. Great to see you guys. Good to see you. How are you doing? Good. Congratulations. On getting this far. <laughs> I'm still in the program. Hey, <laughs> yeah, it feels good to finally get this presentation um, done. I've just been dreading it. So, I mean, I'm excited to share my work. <laughs> All right. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to Mediations. Um, my name is Charlotte. I am going to be moderating today's session. We still have people trickling into the waiting room, so um, maybe let's just give it another two minutes or so. Thanks, everybody, for waiting. And um, yeah, I'll check back in, in at 4.33. And of course, if you want to chat about your work, you know, you're also very welcome to do that. Sunanda, what's the weather like where you are? It's fine. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys pick up your lanyards? I miss the lanyards and the cookie. I, I did, but there really, really is communication that uh, was a little awkward, actually, that they're not mandatory. And supposedly, they start planning uh, uh, using them since summer. So I I think they're good because I'm very forgetful. So lanyard works really well to not forget a car, but I think uh, it's no longer mandatory. So I don't know if in the long mail, they're still distributing them. So nobody is using it? You are not using it? Yeah. I, I am just because I'm forgetful again. So having a big thing connected to them, make it into it's my car, make sure that I don't forget at home. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I hardly see anyone wearing it, honestly. I, I was already using it even before they made this directive. So I have my personal one already. Yeah. Today I look like I'm promoting Western a lot. This is like, <laughs> I'm like you know, a cheerleader or something for Western. That's great spirit. Okay, um, so it's 4.33. I think I don't see any more people coming in. So let's maybe just go ahead and get started. Um, again, hello to welcome to Mediations um, today to this very special edition of Mediations, which we're really excited about because we are today trying something completely new for the first time. And it is a media studies field examination panel. Um, the background to this is that in case, you know, if you're not in media studies, um, all media studies PhD students have to undergo what we call the field exam. It's basically our version of the comprehensive exam. And this involves selecting three big fields of literature, reading a whole lot about them, and then writing an essay about, well, what about, well, kind of about how they go together, um, just to summarize it briefly. And because one requirement of this exam is that the students or, you know, then candidates give a public talk about their findings, we felt that mediations as a student, completely graduate student run speaker series would be a great platform for that, for us to get together, share our experiences, and also learn a little bit about what we're all working on. Um, before we jump into the presentations, I'd also like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Atawandawan peoples, and that the land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. Now, a little bit more about today's session. Um, we have two speakers today, Jada and Sabrina. Each of them will give a presentation of approximately 20 minutes, and after that we will have around 10 minutes for Q&A. I would also like to point out that the session today is being recorded and that with the speaker's permission, we will share the recording afterwards. Um, kindly ask you that you keep yourself muted for the duration of the talks, presentations. Um, again, as I said, will last around 20 minutes. And then for the Q&A session, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment to the speaker, please use the Zoom function to raise your hand. And um, you are also, of course, welcome to post your questions into the chat. And with all of that being said, I would like to introduce today's speakers. Um, first of all, Sabrina, as a PhD candidate in media studies, 
Her research focuses on performing motherhood in, in a digital space. And her fields of studies include social media theory and history, visual culture, the gig economy, and motherhood studies. And uh, Jada Ferrucci is a PhD candidate, also a PhD candidate in media studies. Um, she holds a BA in economic development and international cooperation from the University of Florence in Italy, and an MA in international relations from Aarhus University in Denmark. Jada is currently working as a lead research assistant for the research assistant, sorry, for the Shirk funded project, Surviving Memory in Post-War El Salvador, and her doctoral research focuses on the intersect, um, intersect of environmental justice and social movements activism in the context of anti-mining campaigns. And um, now I'd like to hand it over to our first speaker, and that is Sabrina. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay, so I'm just gonna pull up my uh, presentation here, um, if I can find it. And there we go, there it is. Now I need to make it take up the whole screen. Can everyone see that? Can you see that, Charlotte? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Um, okay, how do I make that so it looks? Um, I think you can click on, if you go to the bottom right corner, there's this little, Symbol that looks like um oh yeah the big expandy square um no nope, like it's um the first there's the zoom right next to that and oh yes the presentation yeah <laughs> I, I found know. it okay cool. all right I know how to use the computer I promise you okay so um I'm just going to start my timer so I I keep it at 20 minutes um so thank you everyone for joining here. This is wonderful. Um, I'm very excited to present because um, all this research has been in my head for the last um, many years. I'm embarrassed to say how long I've been doing my PhD here. Um, and, um, and I did my comps, like my field exam, I presented, defended it to my committee last December. So it's been a year. Um, I was waiting for uh, in-person presentation time and um, things didn't you know, lighten up with COVID. So um, I was happy to see that I could present on this um, for, as part of mediations. So um, my, my topic is uh, millennial mothers performing and selling in the gig economy. Uh, that's very much a working title at the moment. So because I've gone ahead with my research and started on my thesis proposal, um, I found that today, some of the work I did a year ago for my comps that I, you know, I did over the years, didn't didn't like my, I've kind of gone off into you know uh, other areas so I wanted today's presentation to review like look at my comps but also kind of end at where my thesis proposal is headed um so um there we go there's uh, the next slide there my inspiration uh so my research um explores the visual representation of motherhood on social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram, and my approach is informed by social media theory, visual cultural theory, and motherhood studies. The purpose of this framework is to examine digital media use by the millennial generation of the English-speaking mothers who live in urban areas in Canada. Um, but before jumping into that, you know, my theoretical and, and, and research area, I want to just step back and say, this is my inspiration. This is kind of where I came from, um, or why I left a full-time paid job with health benefits to pursue a PhD halfway through my 30s. Why would I do that? Well, because um, in 2013, I started working at a prenatal and postnatal health clinic here in London and um, I called Rebirth Wellness Center and I worked there on and off. Um, I eventually did leave for about a year and you know worked in marketing at um, a tax firm and um, I left that that job to do my PhD and I chose to I wanted to research and learn more about mothers. Um, I was you know in a way doing field work and participating with this group um, of mothers in London and I wanted I didn't know anything theoretical about them. I hadn't studied mothering. Um, I, my BA is in English and uh, film and my master's in it is in drama. So this completely new area. Um, so during my time at Rebirth, I worked on the desk and I answered the phone and I responded to emails and social media. And I um, doc, got to talk to thousands of mothers. Um, the database says, our database says there's 15,000 clients over the years. Um, they've been open for over 10 years. Um, so I got to engage with them and I started realizing that 
my personal issues that I was having with being a mom, and I, I should say that I'm a mother, I have four, four children, um, that my personal issues struggling to find work, um, you know, and trying to be a good mom, these were actually part of a larger community of mothers that were feeling the same thing. Um, so um, here are some moms there working out. Um, th this rebirth does a variety of services for mothers. Um, they, there's workout classes and yoga. There's all, also pelvic floor physiotherapy um, to help mothers um, after uh, if they have uh, cesarean birth or uh, vaginal births. Um, there's mental health. And so what I found over the time, um, I started having these ideas and I wanted to study them um, in university, like as a PhD. But I also, when I was there, I met a lot of like everyone that worked at Rebirth were actually also, not everyone, everyone was, um, no, actually not everyone was a mom. <laughs> uh, some, some of them were mothers, some, um, some weren't, but um, of the mothers I was working with, um, I got to see firsthand of the moms coming in, you know, the physiotherapy therapist running in in the morning, you know, dropping her kids off at, at daycare and then getting a call from daycare, someone's sick and her canceling her day. Um, and I got to see that these women, this collection of 20, 25 other women that I was working with, um, they were all independent contractors. Um, none of us were employees there. We all kind of came together under both collective to help and support mothers, but we weren't employees. We didn't have any of those supports um, and securities as an employee does. So that became my interest was these entrepreneur mothers, you know, they're out there becoming a, a fitness instructor um, and supporting other moms um, in their work. So those um, became my research because, um, because I was working with all these mothers, I saw that um, I would talk to the moms in person and then I would see them online on social media, on Facebook, and I'd interact with them. And I noticed that there was, seems to, there seemed to be two different, um, different um, th stories going on. There was the representation of the moms online. And then there was like the real thing um, in front of me and they seem to be different. So I, these are the questions I brought. Um, how is motherhood constituted visually on social media? What aspects are missing or absent online? How do mothers who work as independent, uh, as entrepreneur, freelance, independent contractors show their work on social media? And what do their stories tell us about contemporary society? Uh, oh, how do I switch to my, oops, okay, whoops. So I brought those three questions um, to my fields of inquiry. So, you know, when you're doing comps, you have to kind of situate your work with in three fields. So the three fields I chose were social media, uh, visual culture, and motherhood studies. Um, in the field of social media, I looked at how social media platforms are integrated into daily life, how people interact online using self-representations, and how those online interactions are different um, or similar uh, to face-to-face -face interactions. Um, in the field of visual culture, how I looked at how digital images convey meaning, um, when shared on social media. So an image can be um, analyzed itself straight up, you know, just as it is what you see in front of you, but it also takes meaning from where it's produced, how it's shared and, and who else views it, the audience. And then in the field of motherhood studies, um, I looked at the word mother. What does it mean to be a mother? Um, why study mothers? Are they, is that even a worth studying? Um, and um, what are some, I learned some of the major areas of interest um, are working mothers and work family policies. So um, some of the themes, and this is how I structured my, uh, my comps, was uh, I, I structured around themes that I kind of, I found similar threads in all three fields that I pulled out. Um, and, you know, and those threads were, uh, to me, they were self-representations online and performance, um, this branding of the self that um, seems to happen. Um, and then I found um, this figure seemed to keep popping up for me, the mompreneur or the, the, the mom who's an entrepreneur. Um, and I included an image there. Um, I did um, just as, you know, some Google, not Google and go, uh, DuckDuckGo searches of, uh, you know, what's a mom pinure look like? So that's kind of one of the stereotypical images holding a baby in front of a computer. <laughs> so, um, 
so the rest of my um, presentation today, I'm almost um, checking the clock, I'm about halfway through, is I'm just going to look at, I can't talk about it all, um, all the research, but I just want to pull out some of the, the interesting bits. And to me, that was about just focus on um, the mompreneur. How do you talk about this person, this, this role, and then placing it within discussions of um, the, a gig economy worker? Um, but to open, I just want to share this quote from Jacqueline Rose, um, because as part of my research, I just kind of read whatever I could about mothers, books, uh, uh, watch films, uh, read plays. Um, and this quote really uh, stuck out to me as um, very, what I, what I was doing in my research, what I was looking for. So uh, Jacqueline Rose says, motherhood is the ultimate scapegoat for personal and political failings, for everything that is wrong with the world, which it becomes the task unrealizable, of course, of mothers to repair. To the familiar claim that too much is demanded of mothers, which has been a longstanding feminist claim, this book will add a further dimension or question. What are we doing? What aspects of our social arrangements and of our inner lives, what forms of historical injustice do we turn our backs on? Above all, what are we doing to mothers when we expect them to carry the burden of everything that is hardest to contemplate about our society and ourselves? unless we recognize that we are asking mothers to perform in the world and for the world, what we continue to tear, well, we will continue to tear both the world and mothers to pieces. And uh, that last line, you know, tearing mothers to pieces is um, resonated with me because I saw that in, in my, in my experience working with mothers that they were pulled in so many directions. They carry so many worry, worries and burdens. They, shoulder the blame for so much and often when um, uh, sometimes when a mother can't make her work and family work uh, like those two competing things work um you know she feels a, a failure you know like how you know how do i satisfy everything so um that's why i'm interested in looking at that mompreneur and this entrepreneur because this person seems to try seems to maybe um, has found this way to make both things work or or not as we as i found out um, so um, first, I just wanted to step back and just define, you know, what's a mother? You know, we all kind of have our ideas. Um, and so I looked around, uh, Sarah Reddix um, in her book states, to be a mother is to take upon oneself the responsibility of childcare, making it work a regular and substantial part of one's working life. Uh, so she kind of defined it as like an activity or a practice. Um, Nina Jenkins um, in her work said, you know, there's really no single meaning or universal experience of motherhood. So if you try to like pin it down and say, this is a mother, it's gonna shift, it's move it, it's gonna be different. Um, so I kept looking around um, and um, I liked this, this um, definition that came from IMS. Um, and IMS is, um, it, it used to be called the Motherhood Initiative for Research and Community Involvement. And they, and they changed it, but they're out of York University and it's um, a scholarly group of mothers doing research um, as well as activists. And, and they had this definition. We recognize that mothers are created through pregnancy, childbirth, adoption, surrogacy, loss, and unchosen sterility. Pregnancy, birth, and nursing can be empowering for some women, but these practices can also lead to oppression, trauma, and even death. Motherhood as a series of actions or sense of identity can be empowering, but this empowerment is seldom realized. The disempowerment women experience is not inherent in the role of mother, but is socially produced, often being exasperated by the patriarchal institution of motherhood. Systems of power and oppression, including racism, sexism, classism, ableism, and more lead to an undervaluing, an undervaluing of care work more broadly and motherhood more specifically. So this, um, so that's quite, uh, large of uh, a definition, but I think it kind of captures all those parts of mothering. Um, and specifically, what I was drawn to was that motherhood can be oppressive, but it can also be empowering. So some radical feminists, such as Firestone, uh, she would say that mothering is inherently oppressive. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's no way around that. It's just when you become a mother, that's what happens. But other feminist writers will say like, no, um, it can also be a site of empowerment for some. Um, so some of those oppressive parts are, um, there's pressure on mothers to be the good mother. Um, there's this intensive mothering um, that happens, you know, um, pressure to, for a mother to be involved in every part of their child um, instead of, you know, sharing the load. 
um, uh, um, there's wage inequalities for mothers, maternal health issues, and just this ongoing burden of pressuring mothers to be um, always uh, selfless. Um, Amber Kisner, just to wrap up this, um, she says that the majority of writers have not taken this position that being a mother is inherently oppressive, largely because it implies that mothers are completely powerless, which buttresses the patriarchal position that women's lives are worth living, uh, are, are, are little worth attending to. So, um, and that for me, I, um, you know, there's this part, I don't know if ever, anyone ever feels this in your research, but you feel like, oh, am I actually studying anything that's worth studying? Um, you know, and knowing that like, no, it's okay. I can study mothers and they're, um, what we learn from them can be helpful. Um, so yeah, so I, when I started looking for this uh, mom premier, um, and you know, how to, how do I approach this person who, um, works online, sells, um, her services and products online. Um, I turned to, uh, Shani Orgad in Hiding Home, uh, a recent book. She argues that mompreneurship is actually not a viable solution for women looking for work and it's largely an uh, unrealistic myth. So, uh, in her work with others, she didn't think, um, it, mompreneurship was realistic at all, but I had this competing real life, um, experience of, as myself working as independent contractor, as well as working with independent contractors um, at Rebirth. So I, I knew some women were doing this, um, you know, this self-employed gig. Um, I also found that when I was looking for anyone who's written about entrepreneur, uh, mompreneurs, I found that some of the scholarship on mothers um, who work as entrepreneurs actually comes under uh, the stay-at-home mother uh, definition. Um, so it's, it's cause they're not sure really sure where, where do you fit this uh, person? Um, they're not working outside of the home for paid work, but they're not inside the home doing, uh, like they're inside the home doing paid work. Um, so overall, I found that there was little feminist uh, research covers mothers who work as entrepreneurs, freelancers, or independent contractors. So, um, and uh, the reason I, I mentioned that is because like in my research, I was always kind of being pushed to find find areas that haven't been explored yet, you know, find a gap in the knowledge, try to be innovative. So. Um, that so after a while that's kind of what I found. So here's this figure of the Montpigneur. Uh, so historically, uh, there's a, this older picture uh, there. Um, so the term Montpigneur started appearing in mainstream U.S. media in the 1990s. Um, it's a conflation of the two words, mother and entrepreneur. Um, and the concept of Montpigneur, I'm aware my son is behind me, um, the concept of Montpigneur usually means a mother of young children and being a mompreneur allows them to balance business and family responsibilities. So um, you could be a, a entrepreneur who's a mother, but your children, you know, they're 30. So, you know, you're not, you're not keeping care of them necessarily. <laughs> um, okay. And this is a more modern image of the mompreneur. It looks like she's got a, a MacBook Pro there um, trying to get some work done with her little one sleeping on her. So uh, the term mompreneur can be seen as positive or negative. So uh, for those who embrace the motherhood side of the word, then it is an apt descriptor, but the others may find the term unprofessional and condescending. So that was like, oh, should I even use the word mompreneur? Should I not? Um, so um, for example, some women say, you know, I started my business before I had kids. So I, I don't, see uh, myself as being a mompreneur, I'm an entrepreneur. So, um, and so what I found was um, that I, my investigation of this, this person, um, this, the mompreneur, I, I'm trying to look at it through as, as a type of knowledge worker or um, gig economy worker. Um, but before I look at the gig economy, I just, I, I mean, you know, I was looking everywhere about who's using this term, what does it mean? And um, I got on Mumsnet, that online forum, and just recently, February 6, 2021, um, someone, the original poster said, you know, what do you guys think of mom boss or mom premier? And uh, someone said, mom premier is the modern term for women, women being paid poorly pay for piecework without the protection of employment law. And um, I just thought, well, you know, that's, that's one way of seeing it. Yeah, when you're working as an entrepreneur, you're often putting in lots of unpaid work hours. I also love the, the, um, the poorly paid for piecework, that alliteration sounded just lovely there and a great summary. Um, so just uh, briefly looking at the scholarship on gig economy workers, um, there's been recent studies on entrepreneurs freelancers and independent contractors, but he's mainly a focused on men who work in platforms such as Uber, TaskRabbit, and um, Airbnb. 
Um, but uh, and a recent report from Stats Canada has found that gig workers represent eight to ten percent of Canadian workers. In, um, so you know, there we do have a sizable chunk, although it's really hard to track them, um, which. Um, Stats Canada makes note of, and they found that during um, the pandemic, it was hard to understand how many independent contractors were actually out there. Um, overall, you know, they're characterized um, gig workers. Um, you know, they have precarious labor. They have low wages. And yet, there's this myth of this uh, myth about this um, this type of knowledge worker that uh, Rosalind Gale talks about. Um, the myth of the web work as cool, creative, and egalitarian. Instead, Gale describes work as low pay, long hours, and bulimic work patterns. So you see that um, in the the mompreneur. Um, um, here's an example. <laughs> uh, this uh, this is Anne. She's here in London, a mompreneur, and you know the, it does look cool and creative and um, exciting and fresh. And so she's um, showcasing some of um, her services there as a nutritionist um, and some of the work she does. Um, and so this kind of led me to look at well, how do you study mompreneurs? Um, and you can look at them as self representations and performance. Um, so when you're online, you're posting pictures and, and choosing. There is this level of playing and make believe that you know that's fun um, that a lot of um, people that you know use social media for themselves or, or for their work you know there's this quality this this fun passion part and it's kind of playful you know playing around with images and how to convey um, uh, information thus um, and Irv Irving Goffman says that Thus, when the individual presents himself before others, his or her performance will tend to incorporate and exemplify the officially accredited values of the society more so in fact, then does his behavior as a whole. So these official credited values are, you know, often, um, you know, like, you, um, like for this example, to, you know, be healthy, hip, um, um, you know, vegetarian, I believe she's vegan, you know, like these certain values she's trying to come across in her nutrition business. Um, okay, and there's another one. Uh, so self-representations on social media are explored, can be explored in terms of the edited self, which is self-consciously constructed image requiring ongoing work to maintain. Uh, so this is an example of, if you've heard of the yummy mummy, um, you know, these, um, these are two young white women with their uh, babies dressed in pastel pink. You know, there's a certain, um, almost this certain, quality you always see in the mom pinure, uh, or motherhood that is displayed and like to be a mom you have to kind of look like this and so even though online there's all this diverse um, experiences um, we often it's just condensed to um, the same images over and over again um, and so celebrities and micro celebrities such as Instagram influencers become role models to other moms about how mothering should look and feel and if your mother, if your mothering does not look and feel like, you know, um, like this, you, you may feel like, hey, I'm doing something wrong, but you're not, um, it, it, it does look different for everyone. So um, I'm at 21 minutes, so I'm quickly going to uh, cut myself off, but I leave you um, with this just, um, this is my central resource question now moving on into my uh, thesis proposal, uh, is how do current images of mompreneurialism on Instagram and Facebook mask the lived experiences of mothers who work as freelancers and how can their knowledge be used to inform changes to work family policies in Canada to better the lives of working mothers. And um, just in closing, um, I, I do believe that the, the, the figure of the mompreneur is a worthy of study because entrepreneurialism is on the rise according to labor reports in Canada. And it offers um, a, you know, a viable solution for families who need to reduce childcare expenses to create their own income because of lack of employment. Um, and it's also my hope that uh, my research has potential implications for policy. So um, how do we help individual um, entrepreneur mothers, you know, access uh, maternity or parental leave um, or, you know, um, sick leave if they need it, you know, as independent contractors, they don't have it. Or how can we take aspects of that we've learned from entrepreneurs and apply it to, you know, uh, regular employment jobs, nine to five. Um, for example, do we need to work five days a week? You know, um, entrepreneurs uh, will often, you know, are able to take days off uh, or, you know, structure their work schedule um, so that it's a little bit more balanced. So um, yeah, that's in closing and I'm sorry I went over, so I'm stopping. Thank you. That's okay, Sabrina. That <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your talk and enjoy your virtual applause. And um, 
now I would like to ask if anybody has any questions or comments. If you do, please feel free to type them into the chat or just raise your hand. I'm currently not seeing anything. So I have a question for you, Sabrina. Oh, yeah. Um, Joanna. Hi, um, I'm, I'm leaping in. I don't know how clear this question is going to be because it isn't formulated, but that was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, for that. And I also find that these images really fascinating. So it's a bit of a general question, um, but it's one that's because I'm really interested. I'm just wondering what you're thinking about doing for your research. Like if you can talk a little bit more about um, maybe what kind what kind of visuals you're going to look at or what, you know, I, I just want to hear more about what your plans are, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, I would like to um, actually talk to and interview entrepreneurs um, because I think I, I kind of have to because if I'm only looking at images, um, I, I know that images are not the full story. So um, some researchers have, um, you know, they like are critical, like they do analysis of the images that are, you know, of social media, you know, of entrepreneurs. Uh, but I also what's missing is that actual talking to the entrepreneurs like understanding like okay why'd you post this you know um tell me about your day like what are some of you know what are some of your challenges so um in my proposal i i outline um and have to get ethics approval for this because to actually talk to people um yeah so i'm doing i'd like to do interviews um and talk to um because i i don't a, a lot of the work on mompreneurs is it's just a, a myth and it's disregarded and we don't really know how many people are actually working as entrepreneurs just because it's not really, um, it's not collected. You know, Stats Canada doesn't even have much collection on that. Cause I mean, at any time you can become independent contractor and do services and then, you know, maybe pick up a job. So I don't know, does that, does that answer your question a bit or? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think it's, I think that you're really onto something um, because there's, uh, there's a lot of invisibility as you're, as you're saying. And, and I think that, I mean, that gets back to some of that early feminist work about the invisibility of feminist labor, right? In the, in the house, but you're kind of coming at it from a different way. Um, and I think kind of connecting this to questions about policy um, and politics is, is just, I find it really exciting and very important. Um, so yeah, no, that's, um, that's, thanks so much for that. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention too that the, the reason I kind of started, I got this idea was not like, you know, like working with mothers, but I was doing a lot of research on mommy bloggers, right? And, and these women are, you know, writing about their lives. And I realized that then I started seeing like some of the blogs that they would write, you know, they're talking about like, you know, receiving a bunch of hate mail because they, you know, want somebody, you know, some people didn't like one of their blogs, right? And just dealing with like, that kind of emotion, you know, and labor, like you keep working on your blog, but like what, what we see in the blog post isn't always what is happening behind. So I was really interested in like, well, who's this person reading, you know, like working on this blog. Um, so it kind of came out of that. Yeah. Invisible labor um, of, yeah, there, there's a human being behind reading that hate mail, you know, like, <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of where some of the inspiration for it. Yeah, and the visual and the visual connection with the textual is really interesting too, because it's like what what's safe to communicate about, what's not safe. To, I mean, and you know that these entrepreneurs don't really have much of a choice, do they? Like they have to promote themselves, and so it's uh, anyway. Um, yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll end there and let Sananda go. <laughs> Sananda, you're on mute. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And as you can imagine, it all resonates with us. Um, um, juggling like like being a mother and um, PhD. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, are you looking at uh, specific social media platforms? You mentioned bloggers. Like I know you started looking at blogs of moms, uh, but are you looking at different social media platforms in this? Because uh, different platforms have their different affordances and also uh, changes, the visual representation changes with um, the kind of audience each platform has. Mm -hmm. Um, I think my, my focus will be on Instagram. Um, when I first started doing this work, uh, social, uh, Facebook was still very much, you know, where a lot of mothers were, 
um, yeah, posting and sharing. And then Instagram has risen up. Um, and then I, I've been doing this so long. I remember like at one point writing about TikTok and I'm like in this very new TikTok. And now, now it's like, you know, everywhere. But um, I think Instagram, because that one is, I believe it's primarily, I mean, everyone uses Instagram, but women, because it's more visual, it's, it's, whereas Facebook still has, um, there's a lot of content there, but Instagram, you can just post images with just a few hashtags. And so I believe I'm going to focus on that. And uh, from the few, you know, um, entrepreneurs that I've looked at their, um, you know, their website, and then looking at their social media, it's usually the Instagram one, that's where they put most of their work. Um, yeah, sorry, that's not a great answer, but <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you have any hypothesis um, as you go ahead? Um, I believe that, okay, yeah, I did. I had like a thesis statement that I, I, I wrote. Um, yes, um, I believe that, well, it's meant to, we can view it as these moms are, are empowering and, and what they're doing, but they're really just selling yourself. Like you're selling your images of your children, um, just to make money in this gig economy, like the, I, I don't, uh, just don't think there's work out there and you're kind of left, mothers are left trying to figure it out. Uh, and you're, as a mom, you're going to do whatever it takes to make some money. So, uh, um, I don't know if that's much of a hypothesis, but, um, yeah, I kind of, I'm just, yeah, I'm still thinking through it. That's great. Um, that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I believe I can go. Um, so I, I want to know whether you are going to look at um, pre-motherhood period. We know motherhood can come about um, as a result of, let's say, pregnancy or adoption. So are you going to cater for this period before one becomes a mother? Oh, looking at women, you know, what they were, what they were doing before they became a mother? A period or of pregnancy, like, are you going to start from when pregnancy sets in um, to the time that birth was put forth or you will just begin from when the person became a mother in natural sense? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, you know what, I haven't, I haven't thought about that um, because it's, yeah, when, when do you become a mother and who, you know, who, um, yeah, when you're pregnant. I think when I'm looking at, when I'm trying to say like, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk to this person, but maybe not this person. Um, I guess if someone says like, you know, they identify as a mother, they're pregnant, they're a mother or they're adopting or even surrogacy, like um, I still, I, I would include it because I think that's one of the, the things I've, I've learned in um, feminist scholarship is to include diverse um, experiences, not just one. So um, yeah, to answer your question, well, I haven't completely thought about it, um, and but I, I'm open to. Um, I, I have a broad definition of motherhood, so of who I could include. Is that is that kind of answer it or? Yeah, perfect, perfect. I'm okay. happy that you say you will be looking at it. So that answers everything. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I see one more question or a comment from Sadiq. Uh, can you maybe park this because we do have to move on with the agenda, but um, we're going to have some time. Um, maybe if you, yeah, again, as I said, if you're happy to pause your question until the end, then um, we can have Jada's talk first. And then in the end, we can open up the Q&A again for um, everyone and all the speakers. Right. All right. So um, thank you so much, Sabrina. Again, thanks everybody for the discussion. And now I'd like to hand it over to Jada. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, looks good. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Charlotte, and thank you as well, Sabrina. Your research is uh, really fascinating. I'm not a mother myself, so even just to uh, learn more about this uh, term uh, that I never heard before was really fascinating and intriguing. So I look forward to read your dissertation soon and uh, see exactly how even, you know, possibly your experience is influencing your research and the two things I believe are moving in uh, uh, tandem. So. 
I'm happy to present as well my field examination essay, or at least the research that has come out of it and is informing my dissertation. I defended my comps in March of this year, and I have recently defended my dissertation proposal. So drawing from the research that I conducted during my field examination, starting from the fall term of 2019, uh, my research, my dissertation actually addressed how social and environmental movements involved in extractive conflicts in particular transform the dynamics of activism and campaigning by reconfiguring the geographies of environmental justice, modifying, for example, the spaces available for the pursuit of justice and denouncing existing forms of inequality. And in particular, my research draws from previous professional experiences and explores three case studies of mining conflicts in Central America. El Escobal in Guatemala, Guapinol in Honduras, and El Dorado in El Salvador. And I'm currently working on my ethics application uh, as well, since I will use a qualitative uh, case study research methods, such as interviews and focus group sessions. And it is particularly tricky during the pandemic, although things seem to be a little more uh, easier now in terms of conducting in-person uh, research and in-person field work, but still that's a uh, uh, left to be seen and the reason why i'm conducting interviews and focus group sessions with uh, ngo workers activists and community leaders is that i am interested in examining the perspective motivations and goals of various actors when it comes to social environmental struggles against mining and how they articulate networks of resistance So in my field examination, I have had to focus on uh, three fields as well, and social movement activism, political economy of the environment, and environmentalism have been the three fields of analysis. And these three fields in particular often conjure up uh, contradictory ideas and uh, nebulous definitions, we could say. And all three of them straddle between theory and praxis and are rooted in the core disciplines of media studies, economics, and geography. And as a media scholar, a comprehensive review of the defining works in these areas is necessary to provide an, an analytic review of the scholarship in each field and clarify central themes, common concerns, and current literature deficits as per the guidelines of the field examination essay. However, an assessment of the voluminous literature in the three areas obviously has raised numerous questions and more than what would have been feasible to answer in a single essay. As such, my review aimed to offer benchmarks for future research in these areas and contribute to a continual, continuing theoretical articulation and practical application of the fundamental concepts of in the academic fields analyzed. And so in particular, my field examination research is drawn on the political economy of the environment following ecological Marxism premises, structure and cultural approaches of social movement sociology, and different strands of environmentalism in the scholarship of geography. And by reviewing and synthesizing the three fields, the related theories helped me analyze the work, role, and impact of social movements and trace the continuous rise of the environmental justice profile in activism and politics, reflecting the growing concern of large scale ecological crisis from a political economy perspective. And just as Sabrina, I also organized my review thematically in order to better grasp the involvement and role of social movements in the political economy, the environment and environmental activism, and how their actions might translate into political influence, collecting, disseminating, interpreting, and producing environmental knowledge. So as part of my presentation, but also as part of my field examination, I have described the three fields and elaborated how each perspective connects to my research, after I've analyzed the three fields common themes by articulating them with the most critical theories in the scholarship and identifying their central concerns, I then identified current gaps in the literature and highlighted future directions for my own research. And finally, I'll just provide a, a brief overview of my dissertation in terms of how it connected to the field examination research. So the first field of analysis has been the social movement theory. And uh, we could say that we live in a movement society, quoting Sidney Taro's words, and as historical resistance and mobilization of the masses are a response to the events of neoliberal globalizations, movements and social movements in particular are an, a particularly important experience that we live by daily. The work of social movements and activism in particular has expanded rapidly since the 70s and the 80s with new forms of mobilization, activism and protest trends. In the social sciences, social movement theory uh, seeks to explain why social mobilization occurs 
and ident identify the forms under which it manifests with potential social, cultural, and political trends. In the social um, and the increased scholarly debate draws on the growing interest and importance of studying social movements, leading to attempts to synthesize different theoretical perspectives, crossing thematic, historical, and geographic boundaries. So in my research, I particularly define social movements as networks of actors organized at the local, national, and international levels, part of complex contestation processes that help define the structure of global institutions and the character of local, national, and global politics. By helping shape institutions, policies, and systems of meaning, social movements are important actors in the global system, forging activist networks, connecting and mobilizing localized citizens and their communities with global political processes, and influencing, influencing policy-making processes as well. And social movement studies have been fragmented and grouped into general categories, such as the collective behavior theory, which is known for stressing the irrationality of protest, this resource mobilization approach, which instead focuses on the resources necessary to convert grievances into over protest behavior, political process approach, privilege, privileging the interaction between protesters and the polity and its impact on collective action forms and outcomes, and also the framing approach, investigating how uh, cultural representations of actors experience development, facilitating the spread of collective action, and also new social movement theory, which as a perspective has investigated the relationship between structural social change and the emergence of new collective actors. And McAdam in particular in the dynamics of contention complained that the field of social movement theory has become divided across disciplinary boundaries, geographic areas and historical eras. And as an attempt to uh, integrate theoretical perspectives in this essay, I've recognized that the various theories involved in the field have raised specific questions about the impact of social movements on the global scene by focusing on key aspects such as their organizing, mobilization, activism, alliances, and coalitions. So naturally, I go more in length in, in my actual field examination essay and uh, given the time constraint is not possible, but it's been an interesting journey in trying to find the common elements throughout this series and try to actually reconcile them as there's been a very heated debates throughout the decades in terms of which theory was becoming prevalent and was seen as more valid to uh, address research questions when it comes to social movements and uh, their role and impact. The second field of examination in this case is that is focused on political economy, particularly political economy of the environment, which is as a scholarship uh, focuses on the understanding of how social and biophysical reality interact with regulatory bodies and non-governmental actors by shaping environmental policies and behavior. This field also studies how people control and periodically struggle for control over the institutions and organizations that produce and regulate the flows of materials that sustain both corporations and the state and affect the environment. Scholars in the field have advanced uh, theoretical, analytical, and uh, policy alternatives combining insights from sociology, political science, environmental ethics, and natural sciences, and include observations on ecological crisis, uh, capitalist accumulation, and even in combined development, among others. The political economy of the environment theory has had initially a productivist orientation, that's how it's called, showing how industrial production, normal workings, damage the environment, which is nothing new. And introduced during the 70s and 80s, impact theories, which instead weigh the relative effects of population growth, affluence, and technological efficiency, have also sustained the development of the treadmill of production, resource extraction, emphasizes the causes of environmental decline, which could be reversed only if capitalism and economic growth were radically reformed. Afterwards, a second wave of theories in the field has focused on environmental destruction and the social movements that challenged the destruction agents during the 70s and the 60s as well. In reaction, states typically created corporatist uh, policymaking circles that include long established moderate environmental and non-governmental organizations and excluded disadvantaged and organized peoples. So in my research, I engaged with political economist readings with a wide ranging Marxist perspective, emphasizing ecological crisis within global capitalism. I've drawn both from a Marxist scholarship and broader political ecology works which yields immense insights into causation and the social distribution of economic and environmental benefits and harms. And on our own orthodox reading, Marxism has something valuable to offer in the analysis of ecological problems. 
This perspective initially questioned the basis of mainstream economics due to a concern for environmental degradation and limits to growth, and as such, capital, power, and inequality have been analyzed for the purpose of this essay, along with the understanding of environmental forces and governance and the activism of environmental organizations and movements. So this has been a, probably the most difficult field to analyze because despite my background in economics, this is the first time that I engage properly with uh, um, ecological economics and other theories that were connected. So I think it's been a, an interesting journey also trying to reevaluate the ecological perspective of Marxist scholarship, which is not often highlighted uh, properly or in a way that actually emphasize um, its work on uh, ecological distribution of uh, conflicts. And the third field that I've examined has been uh, focused on environmentalism with a particular focus on environmental justice theory. And the scholarship in these fields revolves around the concept of uh, uh, environmental justice and the nature of environmental activism and organizations, which are in the midst of a significant shift in focus, uh, goals, and practice. Environmental justices continue worldwide and often remain invisible, except for the efforts of environmental justice activists and scholars that yield tremendous insight into the causation and the social distribution of uh, benefit and harm for communities, for example. And in this field, the more common use of the environmental justice term has been to describe a social movement that focuses on the fair distribution of environmental benefit and harm, since environmental degradation is often a signifier of social neglect and tends to concentrate in areas of the world, north and south, where more impoverished uh, people work and live. The other use of this concept has been uh, as part of an interdisciplinary body of social science literature that includes environmental and justice theories, environmental laws and their implementation, environmental policy and planning and governance for development and sustainability, and finally, the perspective of political ecology. And within the academic fields, environmental justice research has never been confined to a single discipline, and as a result, it has invited the diverse methodological and theoretical approaches. And this scholarship activism interrelates social, economic, and environmental injustices. Race and gender questions are vital in accounting for the social production and distribution of environmental harm and, and its profits. And so the three dominant research phases on environmental movements have revolved around the new values, institutionalization, and radical conflicts, local oppositions in the environmentalist field. The first suggested that new post-material values spawned environmentalism. The provision of economic security was considered to have uh, made it more likely that people shift their attention to new non-material goals, like securing a healthy environment. The second phase of institutionalization noted how many environmental organizations had become increasingly tame as they became institutionalized by develop developing formal organizational stru structures, gaining access to policymakers, and consequently losing the radical edge. And the third um, strand of theory, radical conflicts, local oppositions looked at how radicals and local practical campaigns supplement or supplant those of the increasingly tame national organizations. And indeed, the critical awareness of power and power inequities around environmental issues make environmental justice different from previous environmentalism waves, with wide-ranging discussion of current debates, controversies, and questions in the history, theory, and methods of environmental justice research. This literature considered the many substantive issues, subject of activism, empirical research, and policy development throughout the world by addressing environmental activism at the global scale and attending procedural and participatory aspects and notions of recognition and capabilities. And finally, with the emergence of grassroots resistances and environmental movements around the globe, some authors have broadened the accessibility of the concept of environmental justice to reflect a diversity of claims. Therefore, the study of environmental justice would be incomplete without the analysis of concepts such as justice, democracy, and equity. Yet, justice theory has developed, developed additional ways of understanding justice and injustice processes, which rarely appear in the environmental justice literature and is one of the gaps that I try to address in my field examination research. So I've uh, focused also on the intersection between the three academic fields, which you can see partially here. And while there have been tendencies to maintain sharp distinctions, my project was to seek 
was seeking to bridge contributions from each field to provide a cross-level account and merge research questions with span across them. Scholars have been interested in understanding what kind of academic research can inform the development of social movements and environmental political theories and help activists understand how to translate individual actions into the decisive, transformative and collective actions necessary to create change. Recurring research questions revolve around participation in environmental movements, promotion of environmental awareness and shared understandings about environmental activism. Therefore, in my research, I focused on the emergence of new practices, movements and institutions in environmental politics, which is crucial to understanding the reciprocal effects between global economics, politics, processes of activism, mobilization, and finally, globalization. Part of the research for the field examination has also been the identification of a deficit in the literature, literature gaps, and the limitations of social movement theory, for example, and traditional approaches to the study of collective action in the global south represent a significant gap in this field, as I am analyzing case studies from Central America. Where research has been undertaken in non-Western context, social movements have invariably been analyzed in terms derived from Northern experience. In the absence of a historically grounded empirical research, social movements in these societies and the struggles that underpin them have been denied the complexity of social formations. And this mode of investigation ignores any agency prospect and portrays its members as the victim of tyrannical rules and traditional culture and passive recipients of Northern-led actions. Therefore, more action, attention to historical and non-Western movements will expose us to different understandings of the relationship between self and others and different dynamics of collective identity formation and contestation and allow for a greater understanding of individual motivations or lack thereof to engage in collective, in collective action. There is also very little analysis available on the interaction between state and social movements that result from social movement activity. Beyond description of protest or analysis of the number and type of activities engaged in, Research of this nature would permit insight into the micro processes of negotiation that occur when movements undertake protest and lobbying activities. And long range events analysis cannot explain why some movement strategies and activities generate more positive responses from the state and society more generally when it comes, for example, to environmental justice campaigns. More research indeed is needed on the interplay of social movements, violence and instability to explain the factors surrounding decisions by social movements to take, to take up arms and its impact on the potential to bring progressive social and political change. As a point of connection with the literature on political economy, one of Marx's central analytical strategies is missing from contemporary theories of social movements, mainly his effort to embed power relations in an, an analysis of the political economy as a whole. Since scholarship tend to overlook the effects of capitalist institutions on collective action and how capitalist dynamics indirectly influence movements by shaping political institutions, political alliances, social ties, and cultural idioms. Instead, portions of the recent scholarship examining in this review tend to focus on short term shifts without examining the deeper causes of such shifts. Overall, the disappearance of capitalism from social movement studies results from the waning of Marxism in the social sciences after the 1970s, the so-called cultural turn in academia. As a result, several promising causal mechanisms linked to capitalism dynamics have been neglected. Yet the dynamics of capitalism and political economic factors matter for movements since the capitalist dynamics shape the conditions of their existence through the balance and division of class forces. Um, through my reading, I've also reconsidered the assumptions that Marxism has little to say about ecological problems, as I was mentioning uh, earlier on. And within the social movement theory scholarship, I would like to focus also on the fact that discussion of collective action is not very in academic, in academic literature. Yet, only in recent years have been more systematic and comparative work on this topic began to proliferate, challenge the predominance of single case quantitative studies. And, um, Engaging with these different theories, particularly with political opportunity theories and framing studies from the social movement canon, offer the potential to sharpen the theoretical contributions of the of Central American social movement scholarship, which I'm focusing on, and the subject of my dissertation. At the same time, uh, Northern social movement studies should pay more detailed attention to movement strategies. From this perspective, in recent years, the post-colonial critique within humanities and social sciences argued that the Western world global North discourse dominance 
has continued after the end of colonialism. As such, global knowledge production is still dominated by Western forms of intellectual inquiry, emphasizing supposed objectivity, universalism, and scientific rationality. And I'm trying to challenge that with the analysis that I will conduct and the field work that I'll be able to um, uh, conduct as well as part of my dissertation uh, project. And finally, through there is a Though there is much literature on environmental justice, the majority is dedicated to demonstrating environmental inequity problems and bringing the movement to a larger audience. And very little of the environmental justice literature focuses on and relates the movement to larger theoretical issues, such as the evolution of political practices and the movement's demand. A combination of environmental justice and political economy literature can focus on the political reasons for environmental problems and critiques of policy approaches. But there is a lack of attention on the evolution of a variety in environmental theory and action, in addition to the range of motivation for developing environmental concern. So to better support building a robust movement, research should move beyond the traditional public opinion studies toward a greater focus on a strategic leadership, activism, and collective context that translate into political power. And there are several challenges that have been posed in terms of um, analysis of the three fields. And as essential actors, my aim uh, has been to understand better involvement and roles of social movements in environmental politics and activism and how their actions might translate into political influence. And uh, given the fact that um, my dissertation focuses on anti-mining resistance in Central America, certain uh, aspects of the literature have been uh, I've needed to address in terms of how strict definition of mainstream concepts can be challenged. There's a great slippage between alternative and mainstream definitions of uh, environmental justice, for example. And there's an increasingly transnational worldview to the glo global society, global civil society. And all these are particular aspects that I'm trying to address, even in the formulation of research questions and in the methodology that I'm implementing when I'll be able to interview uh, or um, interview activists, community leaders, and geo workers, and ask them direct questions on uh, these topics. And so I've been trying to uh, analyze the three fields by also proposing strategies to address some of the concerns presented in particular by the social movement literature, explaining how uh, analysts must explicitly disaggregate and specify the outcomes of political opportunities in terms of uh, identifying and comparing potentially discrepant outcomes among different uh, movements and the benefit of uh, explicit comparison across different contexts, paying particular attention to the coalition of actors engaged and adopt overall a process-oriented approach to political opportunities that explicitly examines how they work and how the responses that social movement provoke or inspire alter the grounds on which they can uh, mobilize them. And there are other key aspects, in particular, when it comes to the crisis of Earth that has been described more often in the field of uh, uh, political economy, the environment and environmental justice. Foster wrote that the crisis of Earth is not a crisis of nature, but a social crisis. And because this crisis has social roots, the solution must involve transforming historical relationships on a global scale to fashion a sustainable relationship between nature and society. And some of the movements that I've analyzed are trying to do that. In this direction, it's important uh, that um, without sufficient uh, self-regulation by state management or firms, capitalist societies will suffer ecological crises that do not arise objectively out of the biophysical problems caused by capital accumulation. And in this context is that environmental justice field come into play with an increasing awareness of the relationship between human rights and environment, social justice and human rights are not a priori conditions for environmental protection, but environmental justice activists explicitly put human, cultural, and economic concerns over environmental ones. And this is such a key um, groundbreaking development also in terms of the environmentalism um, evolution. And um, while we think, uh, or we tend to think of environmental activism, education, and policy as beginning in the wealthy industrialized North, this has traveled uh, to nearly every part of the world. In actuality, there have been myriad forms of environmental cons consciousness, practice, and mobilization. And fusing civil rights activism with environmental health concern, the environmental justice movement energized uh, African American, Latino, and Native American resistance to industrial hazards concentrated in their communities, as well as altered academic and policy debates. 
So that's what I've been trying to um, analyze with different social movement theories, political economy, the environment, and environmental justice streams. And with this essay and my future research, my aim has been to flesh out the importance of connections and solidarities and exchanging images and informations between the three fields so that the discourse of interdisciplinary conversations may be seen as a unifying process, bringing together diverse situations and sharing understanding and experiences. Naturally, there are difficulties involved in crossing a discursive boundaries between the three fields. And this is why sometimes uh, classification and hegemonic definitions in the literature can work under the assumption that diversity is a weakness, whereas they argue that a degree of plurality can only be beneficial, especially when studying uh, networks of resistance, which is an, the object of analysis in my dissertation throughout the three cases of uh, anti-mining resistance uh, analyzed. And um, the sites of mining complex in particular and the people resisting extractions are subject to increased control and repression by both the state and corporations. And drawing from the research conducted during my field examination, I'm trying to address how social and environmental movements involved in this complex transform the dynamics of activism and campaigning by reconfiguring the geographies of environmental justice, modifying the spaces available for the pursuit of um, justice. And um, in order to do so, I'm continuing to review the literature from the theoretical lenses of uh, actor nature theory, uh, political ecology, political settlement theory, networks of resistance, and communication across activists and theorize how, in general, connectivities that media enable in networks of resistance and activism can foster uh, environmental justice campaigns and uh, anti-mining resistance movements. And that was it. And thank you so much for the attention. I think it went a little longer than 20 minutes, but um, yeah. Thank you so much, Jada. Um, great stuff. Virtual applause. <laughs> Wait, sorry, I have a um, growling, barking dog in the background, so um, she seems to be quiet right now. Um, any questions for Jada or comments? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, thanks so much for that presentation. I, um, I've been, yeah, I, I, I think that you're really onto something there. Um, and I think that the holes that you've identified are excellent in terms of the gaps in the literature. Um, and so I guess I've got a couple of questions, but I'm wondering um, what anti-mining activist movements you're planning on looking at? Um, and maybe you've started, it sounds like you you've might have, I don't know. Um, and then, I also wondered about, um, I, think that, I think that you're right about the approach to studying social movements has, well, I think it's been limited partly because the, the extent to which um, impact has been acknowledged or political impact has been acknowledged is really limited by time. And so I was just kind of wondering um, if there, and also by this Western bias, as you know, in the in the research. And so I was wondering, I guess my so first question, what what anti-mining movements or activism are you looking at? And then second question, um, are there like one or two key sources um, that you're bringing into your research from a non-Western perspective? Like, is there something really inspiring that you can use to kind of make the case for um, taking into account this kind of coalition building or collectivity or solidarity that you mentioned, which I think is also um, super valuable. Well, thank you so much for your questions. And as a matter of fact, I do have already, uh, I selected these three cases actually because I have a little bit of experience with the activities that's been conducted and it's been, uh, mostly focused on uh, uh, gold project extracted gold and the resistance has been implemented in a way that is very interesting because when these projects come to community sometimes they do meet the approval because they seem to be bringing jobs whereas the resistance movements are trying to argue that the jobs that are brought forward are only limited in terms of time and the actually opportunities that they bring are at a higher cost for the environment so the three movements that i am decided to analyze I've had the different outcomes in terms of either stopping a project or just delaying it 
but most has been about, uh, about precious metals. So I haven't looked in terms of geothermal energy, which is another uh, important case study. So uh, silver, uh, um, gold, some cases are also uh, focused on uh, copper, but mostly in my case has been uh, silver and gold. And the contamination that is almost required in order to extract these uh, precious metals. And the problem, for example, has been uh, the presence of uh, cyanide and arsenic in the waters in the nearby communities. So these three cases are um, at the different stage, whereas one uh, is uh, in El Salvador, a country that has been the first to completely prohibit uh, metallic mining. Guatemala, the case the study that I'm analyzing is currently, uh, the project is currently suspended, but the one in Honduras instead is actually uh, being um, active right now, and it's uh, focused on extraction of uh, uh, open pit mining of silver and contaminating water. So they're diverse in terms of also the political situations when it comes to mining policies. And as per your second question, I think it's been an interesting journey because as an outsider myself, I've been uh, learning directly from um, community activists and NGO leaders. And sometimes it's very interesting to see how part of their action and resistance campaigns are embedded in theoretical context, but they might not argue so. They are, don't have maybe the tools to recognize whether they do something along um, the lines of a particular uh, social movement uh, strand uh, or, or theory. And so for me, there's been the, particularly the work of Escobar and Alvarez, who have been writing about social movement scholarships actually since the 90s. So that's been an interesting part of also the field examination as, uh, essay because uh, due to the focus on books rather than articles, it meant that sometimes the literature I read was uh, older than I would have liked, maybe like in the 90s and 2000s, but that also led me to see an evolution in terms of the study studies on social movement scholarship. and. Um, I would say also Walter Mignolo. I think it's pretty much an always an important uh, reading uh, to do, especially when it comes to the um, on the coloniality and the second thoughts, because I think there's a, a lot to be said, even for me, when I'm trying to uh, implement my research methodology, address the research questions and overall um, ensure that the research tries to reflect the perspective and importance that key activists have been uh, uh, having in their struggle because uh, part of the research in environmental justice has been focused so much on uh, activists from the global north where environmentalism is an important element of their life but it's usually not a cause of survival whereas the case studies i'm looking at are very different where environmentalism oftentimes is not even an active choice it's something that you you are just because otherwise the few limited resources you have will no longer be of use to you so a lot of people wouldn't define themselves as environmentalists, but they are, they absolutely are. Every single practice in their daily reality follows those um, those ideas and those uh, concepts, but there's not been a bridge yet with theoretical conceptions and practical implementation. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, any more questions for Jada? All right, in this case, um, I'd like to open it up for questions for to both of our speakers. I think um, I think it was Sodik, you had a question for Sabrina, now's your chance to ask. Sabrina, are you saying something? Because you're, I think you're on mute. Uh, no, I, um, I, <laughs> I'm just talking to my husband in the other room. <laughs> so um, I'm here if anyone has questions, but I'll just be on mute because um, it's kind of loud here with everyone at home. Yeah, my, my question basically um, has to do with um, Sabrina's choice to study um, women that are working on Instagram. I just want to know, is there a reason for that? Because I know, speaking of varieties, um, there are a lot of people that do freelance work on different platforms like Upwork. So I'm just thinking if you restrict yourself to Instagram, um, the content can be at times perceived to be casual. So I'm just thinking, um, I don't know, if you maybe can consider other um, platform just to add varieties and to add depth to your data collection. Yeah, um, no, that's great. Um, yeah, there's lots of platforms that uh, people use. Um, and for the, 
I guess I, I chose Instagram for the the vid, like the image sharing if like if they were working on their own to promote their services. Um, but yeah, as you said, Upwork, um, I guess like, like once I get out there, if I have trouble finding, um, entrepreneurs to interview, then, um, I'll expand. Um, but that's my idea for now, but, um, but you're right. Yeah. Like, yeah, a lot of people are on, on Instagram for personal and not for, um, and not for work. So, um, good point. Thank you. Any more questions to our speakers? Alex. Kind of dark here. All right, uh, so hand down. Um, actually, uh, one thing I noticed about both of your presentations, um, and I think this has to do with the way the, it works in media studies, is that um, you're looking at the intersection between three fields. Um, that is it's very different than how we uh, do things in libraries, or at very least, it's very different than how I approach things in library science. Um, I'm just wondering, like, did you find that um, restrictive or inspiring or useful uh, way to enter in, like, to, to channel your thoughts? Or did you have, like, I, I would have rebelled against it myself, but maybe it was more useful for you. So I just want to, it's kind of a meta level question. But I hear your experiences about that, if you feel like sharing. Um, sure. Uh, I think it was an interesting exercise, but quite complex, I would say. And as much as I tried, I could never find uh, common concerns that would span across the three fields at once. So across two, it's feasible and something that they really push you to do also to narrow it down towards your research approach and your topic. But it's um, I think it's like a byproduct of the first uh, strand of analysis. So first you proceed thematically as I did, as I think Sabrina as well did. I know some people prefer to instead treat the three fields as silos, basically separated and, and uh, only afterwards they uh, are able to find connections. So for me, proceeding th thematically right away, trying to find the common themes in the uh, three fields was the best way to also identify uh, common concerns. Otherwise it would have been too complex and even the second field which is the most uh, general because it could be either political economy or cultural studies you don't have much of a say in that it started political economy but then i naturally had to uh, narrow it down to political economy the environment which was still super broad i mean uh, it's not like it's uh, by any mean uh, limited but in order to even find common um, themes with the other two that's how i kind of proceeded so i don't know Sabrina, how was your experience instead? Yeah, it, um, that's a great question, Alex, because I was like, well, yeah, why did I do it that way? And I, I can't remember. I, I was looking around for the requirements, but I think it was the requirement, right? Like, I think we had to, like, we had to choose the fields, but then you had to, as you said, like, um, you, you know, how are you going to structure your paper? Are you just going to talk about one field, like, and then move over and talk? Yeah, as three separate silos. So uh, yeah, it was tough. And I think that's why I stumbled on that step for so long, uh, trying to read within each field and then pull out connections. So um, yeah, I definitely, <laughs> I think I pushed against it as much as possible. And, and in the end, just, yeah, tried to, try, yeah, I don't know why I actually, when I think about it, why they do it that way. Um, I'm not sure, maybe it's supposed to be helpful, maybe. Oh, yeah, Alex, I, I don't know if that answers your questions, but I, I did find it um, a challenge. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so it is already five, almost 5.50. So um, are there any more questions to our speakers? Maybe we can take one more. I'm not seeing any hands. So in this case, thank you so much for attending. Thank you speakers, uh, Sabrina and Jada for giving your presentations today. Thanks everyone for the discussion. And um, yeah, this is the end of our first mediations field exam panel. We are probably going to do this every term from now on um, because there's lots of us and we all have to present. <laughs> so um, again, um, thanks for coming and uh, have a lovely night and see you soon. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye, everyone.
Bye. Bye, Sananda. Okay. Right, we're the only ones left, Evan, so I think we can wrap. <laughs> Have okay. a good night. Take care. Okay. Bye.